we're discussing uh, how Satan is attempting to undermine the biblical doctrine of creation. And I want to read this statement from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, March 20, 1879, where she explains the reason why scholars, theologians, would want to try to reconcile the story of creation in Genesis with the evolutionary hypothesis. There's a reason why they do this. Notice this statement. And many who profess to believe the Bible are at a loss to account for the wonderful things which are found in the earth with the view that creation week was only seven literal days and that the world is now only about 6,000 years old. So people who profess in the Bible, Ellen White says, they're, they're at a loss to account for the possibility that this could have happened in six literal days about 6,000 years ago. So what do they do to try to reconcile science, so-called, with the biblical record of creation? Notice, these, to free themselves from the difficulties thrown in their way by infidel geologists, adopt the view that the six days of creation were six vast indefinite periods and the day of God's rest was another indefinite period, making senseless the fourth commandments of God's holy law. Some eagerly receive this position, for it destroys the, fourth, the force of the fourth commandment, and they feel a freedom from its claims upon them. So basically, they kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. First of all, they say, see, we can reconcile the geologic column with the story of creation if we make the days of creation long periods of time. So you can keep both. You just have to reinterpret the days. And then they say, and a fringe benefit or a bonus is that if the days were real long, then we get rid of what? We get rid of the Sabbath as a literal day that we're supposed to keep. The old devil's a real devil. Now let's talk about concordists or accommodationists. Ellen White has warned against the attempt to accommodate the Bible record to the assumptions of science. One thing I want to make clear is that in your syllabus I placed material that I feel is especially relevant for now. This issue of creation and evolution has very important relevance right now in the time we're living. I included a long material on the Indiana camp meeting because music is a problem we have now. Worship we have now a problem. That's why I included that there and I hope you'll read it. Another problem the church has now is the encroachments of pantheism. It's not called pantheism. It's called contemplative prayer. It's called spiritual formation but really it is, it is a pantheistic worldview that is trying to penetrate the Adventist church in an insidious way. And so that's why I included these three examples of how God has protected His church through the spirit of prophecy. And the only way we can protect ourselves today is to go back to the spirit of prophecy because God gave the spirit of prophecy for that purpose. That's the reason why we're dedicating so much time to this issue and what Ellen White has to say about it and it would be good for the church to do this. And incidentally, the, the fundamental belief on creation at General Conference is going to be strengthened. Amen. There's going to be some words added to the fundamental belief, making it absolutely clear they're adding that the days of creation were just like the days of now. Amen. And there are people, there's at least 25 at annual council that voted against the strengthening of that particular fundamental belief. So it shows that there are some in the church that actually believe in evolution. Down, uh, down south from here there are m several scholars of the Adventist church who have embraced evolution. Now uh, let's go to this statement. Inferences erroneously drawn from facts observed in nature have however led to what? to supposed conflict between science and revelation. And in the effort to restore harmony, <laughs> notice how they're going to try to restore harmony, interpretations of scripture 
have been adopted that undermine and destroy the force of the Word of God. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the Mosaic record of the creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And in order to what? What's the next word? Accommodate. To accommodate. What does accommodate mean? It means to, you know, it will accommodate the story of creation to what scientists say, so that you can have both. So she says, in order to accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast, indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. And then she says, such a conclusion is wholly uncalled for. The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. Did you notice the use of the word accommodate? The vast majority of scholars, both Adventists and non-Adventists, agree that the writer of Genesis wanted us to understand that the days of creation were literal, consecutive, contiguous, 24-hour days. But some of them are saying that science has proven that the writer was wrong, and therefore we must reinterpret and accommodate the biblical account of creation to fit the discoveries of contemporary science. They come up with all sorts of alternative explanations, such as pantheism, progressive creation, punctuated equilibrium, theistic evolution, intelligent design. All of these ways try to accommodate the story of creation to the discoveries of science, so-called. Now I'm going to skip this part of this conversation with this uh, pastor uh, because I told this story yesterday where he said, yes, I believe that the writer of Genesis believed that the days were literal, but he was wrong, and science has proven that the days were actually long periods of time. When Seventh-day Adventists, critics, question the literal days of creation, listen, this is a very important point, they must also question the reliability of the writings of Ellen G. White. Now we're taking it a step further. Is Ellen White absolutely explicit that the days of creation were literal 24-hour days? Is there any way around it? Is there any way to accommodate Ellen White to the evolutionary theory? Absolutely not. So if you believe that the days of creation were long periods of time, you have to disbelieve what? You have to disbelieve the spirit of prophecy. And that's what's happening. Ellen White was categorical that the days of creation were literal 24-hour days. In fact, she claims that she was carried back to creation and was shown that the days of creation were like every other day. And even though I read this statement yesterday, I will read it again. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 85. I was then carried back to the creation. Who would you believe? Somebody that was carried back to creation or somebody who's just conjecturing and assuming and, and uh, you know, just speculating about these things? I, I would prefer the inspired record. I was then carried back to the creation and was shown that the first week in which God performed the work of creation in six days and rested on the seventh day was just like every other week. The great God in His days of creation and day of rest measured off the first cycle as a sample for successive weeks till the close of time. Now what part of that is hard to understand? <laughs> Testimonies to Ministers, page 135. When the Lord declares that He made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, He means the day of 24 hours which He has marked off by the rising and setting of the sun. So the days are determined by the sun, as is the week. 
Not, no such loony solar calendar for the week or for the Sabbath. God, the week that we have today is the same week of creation. The seventh day today is the same seventh day. And I never cease to be amazed by some Christians who will say, how do you know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of the days of Christ? And I look at them and I smile and I say, which day do you keep? <laughs> oh, I keep Sunday. Why? Well, because Jesus resurrected that day. So you're saying that the day that you keep, the Sunday that you keep, is the same day of the resurrection of Christ. That would mean that the Sabbath is the same Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, can, they say, yeah, but how do you know that the Sabbath of the times of Jesus is the Sabbath of creation? And I say, because Jesus created it and he would not keep the wrong day. <laughs> People seek for all kinds of excuses to get rid of the Sabbath. It has been said that if you tell a lie enough times, people will eventually come to believe that it is the gospel truth. This is what has happened with the theory of evolution. What began as a theory in the days of Darwin is today accepted as scientific fact. It is an ideology today. And anyone who is disagrees with this is looked upon as an ignoramus. Concerning the theory of evolution, Ellen White once stated, I love the way she expressed this, the genealogy of our race as given by inspiration traces back its origin not to a line of developing germs, mollusks, and quadrupeds, but to the great Creator. If you want to make a monkey of yourself, fine. You know, you have that right. But I came from the hands of the Creator. I did not come from a jellyfish. Now, there are things happening in the Adventist church. Some of our theologians have jumped on the evolutionary bandwagon and teach that the days of creation were millions of years and that there was death long before sin entered the world, and that the geologic column proves this beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I'm going to mention some names now because they've gone on the record. I'm not sharing anything secret, any private conversation. They've gone on the record. The late Richard Hamill, who for many years was president at Andrews University, he was present there, a president there when I was a student in the seminary. He also served as one of the vice presidents of the General Conference. Once explained how, after examining the, examining the geologic column, he had to accommodate the Bible to the discoveries of modern geology. And now I will read his statement. I had to recognize that the forms of life that we are acquainted with mostly, like the ungulate hoof animals, the primates, man himself, exist only in the very top layer of the Holocene, and that many forms of life were extinct before these ever came in, which, of course, is a big step for a Seventh-day Adventist when you are taught that every form of life came into existence in six days. I had felt it for many years. But finally there, in about 1983, I had to say to myself, that's right. In other words, the geologic column is right. The steadily accumulating evidence in the natural world has forced a re-evaluation in the way that I look and understand and interpret parts of the Bible. The same is do being done with women's ordination. This issue of women's ordination, forgive the detour, is not really about women's ordination. It is about how you interpret the Bible, whether you accommodate the Bible to what you want. That is the big issue. It's hermeneutics, methods of interpreting Scripture, accommodating Scripture 
to what culture wants today. Well, let's leave that behind. Let's talk about Ronald Numbers. One time, Seventh-day Adventist Ronald Numbers, who was a grandson of a former General Conference president, Branson, explains in the introduction of his book, The Creationists, how and why he gave up his Adventist views on a literal seven-day creation week and became an agnostic. This is how he expressed it. Having thus decided to follow science rather than Scripture on the subject of origins, I quickly, though not painlessly, slid down the proverbial slippery slope toward unbelief. Interesting, huh? In 1982, Numbers served as an expert witness in favor of evolution against a creationist lawyer by the name of Bird. Notice what Numbers affirmed about Bird's assessment of him. Bird publicly labeled me as an agnostic. The tag still feels foreign and uncomfortable but rather accurately reflects my theological uncertainty. An agnostic does not deny the existence of God. An agnostic simply says, I don't know. I am uncertain. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, I became an agnostic. Ellen White, as if writing personally to numbers long ago, predicted what would happen if science, falsely so-called, should supplant the biblical account of creation. And here is her statement. I have been shown that without Bible history, geology can prove nothing. Relics found in the earth do give evidence of a state of things differing in many respects from the present. But the time of their existence and how long a period these things have been in the earth are only to be understood by Bible history. It may be innocent to conjecture beyond Bible history if our suppositions do not con contradict the facts found in the sacred scriptures. But when men leave the Word of God in regard to the history of creation and seek to account for God's creative works upon natural principles, now notice the terminology, they are upon a boundless ocean of uncertainty. Is that the very word that uh, Ronald Numbers used? Absolutely. It would have been a good idea for him to read this statement from Ellen White. It would spare him a lot of anguish. Notably, an agnostic is not the same as an atheist. An atheist denies the existence of God, but an agnostic is uncertain whether God exists. Thus it is notable that Ellen White should use the expression boundless ocean of uncertainty to describe those who are not sure that the biblical account of creation can be trusted. In another place, Ellen White explains why human knowledge cannot be fully trusted in the matter of origins. And what happens when men of science and theologians lose their confidence in the trustworthiness of the Bible on this particular subject? I want you to notice how she con constantly emphasizes the need for the Word of God. She says, human knowledge of both material and spiritual things is partial and imperfect. Therefore, many are unable to, what's the next word? Harmonize. Mm, harmonize their views of science with Scripture statements. Notice, their views of science with Scripture statements. Many accept mere theories and speculations as scientific facts, and they think that God's Word is to be tested by the teachings of science, falsely so-called. 1 Timothy 6.20, that, that's the, a quotation from 1 Timothy 6.20. The Creator and His works are beyond their comprehension, and because they cannot explain these by natural laws, 
Bible history is regarded as unreliable. Those who doubt, now notice what the slippery slope is, those who doubt the reliability of the records of the Old and New Testaments too often go a step further and doubt the existence of God. Notice that they don't deny, they what? They doubt the existence of God and attribute infinite power to what? Nature. That's pantheism, folks. Having let go of their anchor, they are left to beat about upon the rocks of infidelity. Would it be well for us to listen to the prophet? Is she relevant today? in a denomination that where some are starting to question whether we can trust the account of creation? Now the question is, did God use evolution as His method of creation? The God of evolution and the God of the Bible are totally incompatible. The scriptures describe God as loving, kind, and good. He made everything what? perfect, and cares for His creation. In stark contrast, the process of evolution is cruel and merciless. Notice how one writer described the evolutionary process. Evolution presents a bloody, ruthless struggle for existence from the very beginning, where there is much what? Waste. Much waste of living substance and many false starts and blind alleys. The Bible portrays Jesus as the Creator. The question is, would Jesus, who instructed His disciples to pick up all that remained, that nothing be lost, after He had fed the 4,000 and the 5,000, would He use such a wasteful method to create? Evolution functions on the basis of the survival of the fittest. The strong win and the weak don't survive, they disappear. Evolution is a method of trial and error. It is a method that requires significant time to iron out the glitches in the process. Does such a method reflect your view of God? Is God such that He could not get things right the first time? The idea of cruelty and death before sin is an attack on God's wisdom. It is an attack on His omnipotence because God had to use evolution, trial and error, full of glitches. Couldn't He just do it right the first time? Furthermore, it is an onslaught against God's goodness. Would a God whose eye is on the sparrow who even has the hairs on our heads numbered, use such a cruel and wasteful method. Are you understanding how this gives God a black eye? Now there's something more. The Bible describes an unbroken chain of events. Adam and Eve were created perfect. They had a literal fall into sin. As a result, sin entered the world and passed to all men. Therefore, death came in in consequence of sin. Therefore, we need a Redeemer from sin. In order to have any hope of a new world where there is no sin and no death, there is a chain that depends on creation. If there was death before sin, then the link between creation and redemption is broken. Are you with me or not? Because it would mean that sin is not, uh, sin is, death does not come as a result of what? Of sin. And if death doesn't come as a result of sin, then redemption is not redemption from sin. The link between creation and redemption is broken because redemption is deliverance from death. A Roman Catholic theologian, Carl Schmitz Moorman, and this is quoted in Creation, Catastrophe, and Redemption, page 112, has this to say. Remember, he's a Roman Catholic. 
the notion of the traditional view of redemption as reconciliation and ransom from the consequences of Adam's fall is nonsense for anyone who knows about the evolutionary background to human existence in the modern world. Further, he states that salvation cannot mean returning to an original state, but must be conceived as perfecting through the process of evolution. Are you starting to catch, and chat, catch an interesting picture about why Ellen White emphasized the importance of a literal creation? She is very relevant today. Frank Lewis Marsh, long-time Seventh-day Adventist creationist, um, had this to say, If death and the law of tooth and claw existed long before man, and if man evolved through these natural processes, then there could not have been a perfect Garden of Eden, nor a perfect Adam and Eve, nor could there have been a real fall in which man became subject to sin. If that is so, what is the theological meaning of Jesus' incarnation and atonement? Paul connects the two. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. If there was no garden of Eden with its tree of life, what is the future that Revelation 22 depicts for the redeemed? The question that begs to be asked is this, how much longer must creation wait until the process of evolution reaches its goal? That is, if, evolu if evolution is true. Millions of years? Billions? This certainly doesn't offer very much hope of an imminent coming of Jesus to make all things new. Because if He wasn't able to do it at the beginning, what makes you think He's going to be able to do it at the end, quickly and miraculously and supernaturally? Does your view of origins impact your view of end time? So why is our name Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> because our church has the beginning right and it has the end right. Amen. And it is by a supernatural, direct, miraculous intervention, rapid intervention of God into human history. Not from inside, but from outside. Further, how long will it take for God to create a new heavens and a new earth? Will He use evolution as His method once again? <laughs> if He does it quickly, why didn't He do it that way in the first place? Evolution impacts our concept of end time events and the second coming. How many millions of years must we wait for lambs and wild beasts to live together in harmony? How long must creation cry out for deliverance if you believe in the evolutionary hypothesis? I want to finish by reading one last statement in Christian Education 191 and 192 where Ellen White puts it all together. She says, but apart from Bible history, geology can prove nothing. Those who reason so confidently upon its discoveries, that is of geology, have no adequate conception of the size of men, animals, and trees before the flood or of the great changes which then took place. Folks, the flood was a cataclysm. Do you know that some of our scholars are saying that the flood was a local flood in the valley of Mesopotamia? Yeah, some of our theologians are saying that the flood was not a world global flood, it was a flood over in the region where, where Iraq is today, a local flood. Totally against the views that we find in Scripture. But once you start fiddling with creation, you start fiddling with everything in Genesis 1 through 11, because Genesis 1 through 11 is unique. <coughs> when you look, you know, when you look at, uh, at archaeology and geology, you know, the events in Genesis 1 through 11 are absent. 
Some people say, well, if you can't prove it from history, and you can't prove it from geology, and you can't prove it through archaeology, then it must not have happened. Long ago, I settled that I'm going to believe because I have faith. Amen. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? She continues saying, relics found in the earth do give evidence of conditions differing in many respects from the present. But the time when these conditions existed can only can be learned only from the inspired record. In the history of the flood, inspiration has explained that which geology alone could never fathom. In the days of Noah, men, animals, and trees, many times larger than now exist, were buried and thus preserved as an evidence to later generations that the antediluvians perished by a flood. God designed that the discovery of these things should establish faith in the inspired record or the inspired history. But men, with their vain reasoning, fall into the same error as did the people before the flood. The things which God gave them as a benefit they turn into a curse by making a wrong use of them. So, God has provided guidance and protection to the Seventh-day Adventist Church concerning the doctrine of creation through the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. God has made it explicit in the writings of Ellen White that you cannot interpret the days of creation as vast long periods of time to try and reconcile the biblical record with science, so-called. You might be able to just read the biblical story and say, well, you know, yeah, they could be long periods of time. You can't do that with Ellen White. She's explicit and clear. She amplifies what is already contained in principle in the Genesis story. Because there's plenty of evidences in Genesis that these were literal days. I shared those with you. And so Ellen White takes what the Bible says and she says, Here, let me put it in black and white so you cannot misunderstand. And it would do be well for us to simply listen to what the prophet has to say. Amen. Now let's go to page 209. And we're going to discuss another way in which God guided and protected the Seventh-day Adventist church through the spirit of prophecy. I'm convinced that if it hadn't been for the spirit of prophecy, we would have no Seventh-day Adventist church today. I mean, you look at, at the trajectory of the spirit of prophecy, we would have no Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, it might have been founded, but it would have disbanded by now. It would have fallen apart. Because at each step, Ellen White guided the church in what to do in critical situations, in its organizational system, in its health system, in its educational system, Ellen White's hand was in it all the way. And we're going to take a look now at the pantheism crisis that arose in the Adventist church. The recommended reading is Selected Messages, Volume 1, pages 201 to 209. There are other places, but this is the, the a prime place where you want to study this crisis that the Seventh-day Adventist Church play, uh, faced in the early 20th century. First I want to read four, four quotations from Ellen White. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. In other words, history teaches les us lessons that we need to learn for now. The philosopher Santayana once said, those who fail to learn from the mistakes of history are bound to repeat them. So we better learn from the pantheism crisis. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. A better translation would be, people lose what? Restraint. And there's a lot of loss of restraint in the Adventist church these days, folks. You know, the restraint is our doctrinal beliefs, our fundamental beliefs. There's a lot of lack of restraint when it comes to that in Seventh-day Adventist circles. It would do well to us to listen to the prophet, the prophet who had visions. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And God predicted in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will what? Depart from the faith, giving, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of 
demons. We're going to study one of those doctrines of demons in the next few minutes. Let's analyze the biblical view of God. God is an infinite personal being who inhabits a specific place which the Bible calls heaven. Let me explain this. God is not physically present everywhere. Did you hear what I said? God is not physically and personally present everywhere. He is present everywhere because His infinite mind is able to grasp everything that is happening everywhere simultaneously. But God is sitting on His throne in heaven. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father, which art everywhere. No. We can focus. He's sitting in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place. He's there. He's everywhere because of His infinite knowledge. He is omnipresent because He is omniscient. He is not present personally everywhere. God is transcendent. This means that He is outside and above His creation. He is before His creation and distinguishable from His creation. He is the cause and creation is the effect. He pre-existed all things and brought all things into existence. God is not the universe. God existed before the universe. He caused the universe to exist. He is transcendent. He is above and beyond His creation. He is not in creation. He is not part of creation. He is the creator of everything that exists. Christ taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven. This shows that God is a person because He's a Father that He inhabits a specific place, heaven, and that He created us because He is our Father. Isaiah 57 verse 15 presents the relationship between the transcendence of God and the immanence of God. See, God is way up there, but He's also with us. It says in Isaiah 57 15, you say, how is He with us? Well, He's with us because He has infinite knowledge. Let me ask you, is God aware of what's happening in China now? Is God aware of what's happening in Mars? Is God aware of what's happening in the, uh, con in the constellation of, of Andromeda? Is God aware of everything that's happening all over the universe? Does God have to be present personally to know what's happening in all of the universe? No, He's present everywhere through His infinite knowledge. And if you read Psalm 139, very clearly, that psalm, which we usually use to say that God is omnipresent, it's really a psalm about His omniscience. He is omnipresent because He is omniscient. It says in Isaiah 57, verse 15, For thus says the High and Lofty One who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. That's heaven, by the way. And then he also says, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So he inhabits heaven, eternity, but he is also with us. And he is with us through the ministration of the Holy Spirit who performs his functions through the ministry of the angels. Now, what is the worldview of pantheism? According to pantheism, God is an impersonal essence or force that permeates the entire universe. For pantheism, everything that is, is God. Stars, planets, trees, plants, animals, human beings, minerals, you name it, all is God. A kindred heresy is known as panentheism, which means that God is in everything. There's not much of a distinction there, folks. In pantheism, 
There is no distinction between nature and God because they are one and the same. We usually think of pantheism as the foundation of oriental religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, and this is true. But there was a time in the early 20th century when pantheism attempted to sneak into and overwhelm the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The story I am about to tell you is not only a lesson in history, but also a lesson in prophecy. For Ellen White has warned us that the Alpha heresy will once again raise its ugly head in the church as the Omega. It will be the same deadly virus, but it will morph into a different form. We begin our story with John Harvey Kellogg, who was a very influential physician in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. He was the founder of the world-famous Battle Creek Sanitarium, as well as a brilliant surgeon, inventor, and health reformer. As early as 1897, Dr. Kellogg began teaching some strange ideas about the nature of God. In 1897, at a general conference session where he was asked to speak, he stated this, Gravitation, you know the law of gravity, right? Gravitation acts instantaneously throughout space. By this mysterious force of gravitation, the whole universe is held together in a bond of unity. We have here the evidence of a universal presence, an intelligent presence, an all-wise presence, an all-powerful presence, a presence by the aid of which every atom of the universe is kept in touch with every other atom. This force that holds all things together, that is everywhere present, we believe that God sustains the universe from where He's at not in it. This force that holds all things together, that is everywhere present, that thrills throughout the whole universe, that acts instantaneously through boundless space, can be nothing else than God Himself. What a wonderful thought that this same God is in us and in everything. Danger signals already in 1897. Later on, in 1903, in his famous book, The Living Temple, he had expanded his views. On page 29 of the book, The Living Temple, Dr. Kellogg affirmed, Suppose now we have a boot before us, not an ordinary boot, but a living boot. And as we look at it, we see little boots, crowding out at the seams, pushing out at the toes, dropping off at the heels, and leaping out at the top. Scores, hundreds, thousands of boots, a swarm of boots continually issuing from our living boot. Would we not be compelled to say, there is a shoemaker in the boot? So there is present in the tree Where? In the tree, a power which creates and maintains it, a tree maker in the tree. Pantheism. Soon people began to take sides. More and more people sided with Dr. Kellogg because he was very charismatic and he was very persuasive. He was a very persuasive person. He would not take no for an answer. A number of prominent physicians, teachers, ministers, and theologians as well as administrators who revered revered and honored uh, Dr. Kellogg accepted this new philosophy as it came to be called. They claimed that this philosophy brought God so much closer to us. No one in the church seemed to detect the danger, the mortal dangers lurking beneath this so-called new light. 
about this same time, Elder W. A. Spicer, who was 13 years younger than Dr. Kellogg, uh, he had just returned from mission service in India, providentially. Uh, w. A. Spicer had a conversation with Dr. Kellogg. Dr. Kellogg asked him if he could converse with him. He was intent on winning over Elder Spicer to his point of view. Spicer himself later explained that in the interview he began by thinking that this was just a battle over semantics, that it was not a really a battle over real issues, but it just a battle over terminology. People were misunderstanding the terminology that Dr. Kellogg was using. But as the conversation progressed, <laughs> Elder Spicer could tell that there was a real problem, not semantic, but in substance. Kellogg asked Spicer, Where is God? Elder Spicer told this story. Spicer answered, God is in heaven where the throne of God is. Kellogg then replied, Heaven is where God is, and God is everywhere, in the grass, in the trees, in all of creation. It became clear to Spicer, according to his own testimony, that there was no place in Kellogg's scheme for angels ascending and descending between heaven and earth. And of course there could be no heavenly sanctuary that needed to be cleansed. In fact, Kellogg, pointing to his heart, told Spicer, the sanctuary to be cleansed is here. Spicer immediately detected the serious implications of Kellogg's new theology. There was no need to pray to God in heaven, because He is everywhere. There is no distinction between the sacred and the common. All is equally holy, because God is in everything. Spicer explained that he listened to Kellogg, that as he listened to Kellogg, heaven and earth seemed to disappear in a mist. Spicer, having just returned from India, immediately recognized the pantheism in Kellogg's ideas. He did his best to persuade Dr. Kellogg that heaven is a real place, that God is a real person, and that the things of creation were made by God, but were not God, all to no avail. On February 18, 1902, the world-famous Battle Creek Sanitarium burned to the ground. It was decided that Dr. Kellogg would write a book on health and the proceeds would be used to rebuild the sanitarium. It was agreed, however, by the leaders and Kellogg that he would not include in his book any of the comments that he had made on the nature of God. Kellogg agreed and undertook the project of writing this book, which he finished in 1903. The name of the book was The Living Temple. When the proofs of the book were read, it was found that the book was riddled with Kellogg's pantheistic ideas. Notice the following examples from his book. By the way, I have a copy of this book, an original copy of the book Living Temple. I haven't read it because Ellen White didn't even want to read it. <laughs> uh, her son had to practically twist her arm to the breaking point so that she would read this book. She said, no. I'm not going to read it because of the sentiments that were found in the book. If God's prophet didn't want to read it, have mercy. The Living Temple, page 28. God is the explanation of nature, but not a God outside of nature, but in nature, manifesting Himself through and in all the objects, movements, and varied phenomena of the universe. He also explained that certain phenomena were a physiological, and we quote, quote, a physiological proof of the existence within the body of some power superior to the material composition or substance of the body which exercises a constant supervision and control whereby individual identity is maintained. God Himself, the divine presence in the temple. To sustain his view, Kellogg quoted the Apostle Paul's declaration that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
In fact, the book was filled with Scripture quotations that gave it an aura of biblical authority. Ellen White commented on this in the following way, All through the book are passages of Scripture. These Scriptures are brought in such a way, are brought in in such a way that error is made to appear as truth. Erroneous theories are presented in so pleasing a way that unless care is taken, many will be misled. It was a very deceptive theory that he was attempting to bring into the church. Kellogg furthermore stated in his book, Let us not forget that sunlight is God's smile of benediction, that the sunshine is heaven's light and life and glory. And the true Shekinah, the real presence with which the temple needs most to be filled, that the cooling breeze is the breath of heaven, a veritable messenger of life carrying healing on its wings. In view of the opposition to the publication of the book, Kellogg decided to appeal to the General Conference Committee, the GC Committee. But to Kellogg's surprise, Elder A. G. Daniels, along with others on the committee, refused to approve the publication of the book. But Kellogg insisted that his views were new light, which needed to come before the people. So at length, the General Conference Committee established a committee of five individuals to bring a report to uh, the General Conference Committee on the suitability of the publication of the book. The subcommittee, in its deliberations, was divided. Three were in favor of the publication, and two were against. One of those who was, was against was A.T. Jones. Now the interesting thing is, uh, yeah, one who was in favor was A.T. Jones. But the General Conference Committee voted against the majority and in favor of the minority. So the committee uh, voted yes publication, but the General Conference Executive Committee said no. <laughs> they accepted the minority report. This angered Kellogg, and he demanded a hearing before the General Conference Committee, and it was granted. Meanwhile, the controversy was spreading on a broader scale. Influential teachers, ministers, physicians, and administrators were all taking sides. And as a result, a crisis was brewing that threatened to tear the church apart. Now here comes an interesting part of the story. In spite of the fact that the General Conference Committee voted not to publish the book, Dr. Kellogg sent a private order to the Review and Herald publishing house to print 5,000 copies of the book at once to our very own publishing house, folks. In other words, our very own publishing house was printing material saturated with spiritualism, contrary to the counsel of the General Conference. Ellen White had warned of judgment to come upon the publishing house. In her words, 8 Testimonies, page 97, In visions of the night I have seen an angel standing with a sword of fire stretched over Battle Creek. Now providentially, just as the book had received its final corrections and was about to be printed, the factory burned to the ground and the plates were ruined. Fire a fire chief, Weeks, that was his last name, described the fire that destroyed the printing press. He said, There is something strange about your Seventh-day Adventist fires, with the water poured on acting more like gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> Kellogg, however, was determined to publish his book, so he sent a copy to another publisher, and a few months later a large edition, which is the one that I have, of the Living Temple was printed. Energetic eff efforts, this is important, were then made by Dr. Kellogg to recruit young people to sell it. Because he had great influence with the young people of the church. Now let's discuss the Autumn Council of 1903. The Autumn Council in 1903, that's where basically where the Executive Committee of the General Conference meets. It was held at Tacoma Park, Maryland. 
where the General Conference headquarters had just recently moved. The central point on the agenda was how to expand the preaching of the gospel to the world. What a wonderful agenda! That really should be the agenda of the San Antonio General Conference too, by the way. As the meeting was beginning, a group of about ten men came into the meeting hall and loudly protested the attitude of the denomination toward Dr. Kellogg's book. They demanded that the agenda be changed to hear their grievances, and this was done. That evening, after a long day of conflict and debate at the annual council, A. G. Daniels, who was president of the General Conference, walked home and he told this story, accompanied by a fellow worker who had embraced Kellogg's teachings. The worker said to Daniels, as Daniels recollected, You are making the mistake of your life. After all this turmoil, some of these, some of these days you will wake up to find yourself rolled in the dust and another will be leading the forces. Elder Daniels answered, I do not believe your prophecy. At any rate, I would rather be rolled in the dust doing what I believe in my soul to be right than to walk with princes doing what my conscience tells me is wrong. Amen. So Elder Daniels was going to stand firm when it came to this. Now in our next uh, segment that we're going to discuss after we take our break, we are going to see where Ellen White intervenes in the whole picture. There is a miraculous arrival of two letters from Ellen White when Elder Daniels arrives at his house. Ellen White at that time was in California. And by the way, there was no email. It took weeks for letters to arrive from California to Tacoma Park, Maryland on the East Coast. And yet, right on time, when it was needed, that very day, two letters arrived from Ellen White, where Ellen White warned Elder, Elder Daniels to stand firm and to meet this crisis with determination. Right at the right time, God intervened through the inter instrumentality of the Spirit of Christ. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.